All right. Thanks for having us. Uh, we're excited to be here. This is a topic that uh, we uh, hold near and dear to our hearts. Um, just a little forewarning, though. This is not going to be a sexy conversation that's about an NFT launch or a new altcoin we're about to drop. Nope, not, none of that. This is going to be about regulation, risk, security controls. Uh, and that's, that's a still a very, very important topic. I think there's been a lot of people talking about it today. It's about making sure we don't end up in the newspaper with bad headlines. That's the, that's the whole point of this. Um, what I'll be clear about is this, this is not going to be a conversation where we tell you um, this is the hoop you have to jump through to make your regulators happy, or these five steps you know, will get you to be regulatory compliant, quote unquote. Right? This is about responsibility. This is a conversation about doing what's right for your customers and creating safety and security. It's a conversation about doing the right thing for your um, investors to make sure that uh, you, know, you, you have a stable environment to grow. And frankly, this is a conversation about responsibility back to the ecosystem because you know, a, a bad headline somewhere in the ecosystem takes the entire ecosystem backward, right? And that's what this is about. Um, well, with that, we'll get into it. My name is Joe Cody. I'm a partner at Deloitte in the consulting practice. I lead a practice called Digital Banking and also a practice called Digital Asset Consulting. With me on stage are three experts that live and breathe this stuff every single day. Um, we're going to start with Amy. You're an uh, audit and assurance partner. You uh, have the enviable or maybe unenviable job to uh, do accounting work for our clients that are investing in this space. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about what's changed with accounting lately and when you see the state of the market. Thanks, Joe. Well, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I spent a couple of years at the FASB, and for those of you who don't know what the FASB is, they are the group that basically sets the accounting standards in the US, and so when you see news about somebody's balance sheet or what you see on their income statement, that's all based off of generally accepted accounting principles. And we've come a really long place, Joe. And so when I started at the FASB, um, I worked on their first agenda request of how to account for digital assets. And the FASB actually decided this isn't an area that we need to work on. Um, but that was several years ago, and here we are now. They actually have a project on their technical agenda. Um, we should be seeing something very soon. If you're not familiar with accounting for how, um, for what companies have to do for accounting today, it's a really, really bad model. So basically, if you hold Bitcoin, you're going to have to write it down every single time the price goes down, and you never get to write it up. Um, and so a lot of people say, you know what, that doesn't really reflect the economics. And so the FASB is working on a model to get to what we call fair value, which is basically to mark it up when the price goes up, mark it down when the price goes down. Um, and so we'll, we'll hopefully be seeing that pretty soon. Cool. All right, next up, Aaron, uh, you're a tax partner. You help our clients uh, figure out that are investing in this space, offering new products in this space, what the tax impacts are. Uh, you want to take us through what the state of play is with uh, taxation? Yeah, thank, thanks, Joe. Um, you know, when I think about taxation in the digital asset space, it is evolving. Right, I think tax regulators globally, really, and, and particularly in the U.S., which is where I focus, they want to, you know, put rules that give clarity while also giving entrepreneurs and innovators space to, to roam, right, space to develop. They don't want to make the rules too restrictive, but they also want to make it such that when you all come up with, you know, the next innovation, you come up with the next type of novel transaction type, that you have clarity how that will be, how that will be taxed, right? So that's a tough job. Um, what we have so far, at least in the U.S., is that digital assets are taxed as property. Um, working on a better definition for that, right? You know, they're working on a better definition for that. But the question that we currently are dealing with is what type of property? The tax code is specific definitions for security, for commodity, for other types of property that, that may exist. And the question that we often wrestle with is when we look at um, a token, right? How is that, what, what does that look like? What are its characteristics like? And we'll talk a little more about that as we dive in. Um, you know, the, the um, other piece of advice I would have is start early and figure that out. I mean, that's really when you're, you know, at inception of your company, get a sense of, of what the parameters are. That's often where we play and we help is giving a, a sense of, of what, the, uh, what the fences might look like, what are those guidelines, so you can develop in a responsible manner. Awesome. Um, third pillar of the poll we have, or the tent, uh, Megan, you're a regulatory expert. Uh, you have been tr tracking the space for a long time. Uh, tell us 
What's different nowadays versus, say, five years ago in the regulatory space? Um, sure. Thanks, Joe. So I think what we've seen um, in the last few years is the regulatory approach kind of going from we should maybe do something about crypto to we really want to do something about crypto right now. And um, so in the in last March, uh, President Biden issued an executive order related to digital assets, and it called for this slew of reports from the federal agencies to try to kind of get the federal government to um, really lock in what its approach to digital assets would be. And those reports, most of them were due September, October timeframe, and so that, that process of the agencies evaluating and developing their approach coincided with the market downturn of the last year. And so the truth is that I think my view is that that created some skepticism, particularly on behalf of the executive branch agencies about the asset class and the industry. And um, so right now in Washington, the temperature is a little chilly. We're seeing the um, regulators kind of do more enforcement. Um, and, you know, that's just one piece of the pie. You know, Washington can't be as simple as like 10 odd financial services regulators. Um, there's also the Hill to consider. And so Congress is pretty interested in, um, in the space. And um, in uh, November, during, with the midterms, you know, the House flipped narrowly. So you have a new chair on the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry, who's very committed to seeing legislation in the space and um, working on bipartisan lines to sort of try to provide the industry more clarity. Um, and he's already established a digital asset subcommittee. Um, so over the next year, you know, we expect to see and we'll be monitoring more activity there as well. Awesome. All right, let's take this down a level, guys. We're going to go into our first topic. Uh, we're going to talk about custody. So this is uh, if you're a custodian of digital assets, cryptocurrency, or you work with custodians of digital asset and cryptocurrency. This is a big one. Um, so Amy, we'll start with you. Um, you know, for an entity that's a custodian, um, what are the specific tax, uh, sorry, the accounting uh, things you need to worry about uh, as one of these organizations? So Joe, if you think about don't think about crypto. If you think about traditional securities, right, generally, whoever you invest or you hold your, your securities with, your broker-dealer, they don't account for any of your securities on their balance sheet. All of that is off-balance sheet, and that's generally the model for most custodians, I'd say generally. Um, and in, in the digital asset space, that's what most entities were doing. Um, up, up until recently, so the SEC issued um, what they call SAB 121, which is a staff accounting bulletin. It's not a rule. It's an interpretive, interpretive guidelines. Um, but interpretive guidelines kind of means you need to apply it if you're regulated by the SEC, which basically now requires entities who safeguard assets on behalf of their customers that are digital assets having to record an asset and a liability to reflect this, I'm going to say, air quote, safeguarding obligation. Um, and it really, I think, stemmed out of the SEC believing that this asset class just has different and unique risks. So kind of talking about some of the things that Megan was saying, those risks really they feel cannot be um, you know, off balance sheet and kind of hidden and they need to be out there in the open. And so what do they do? They require you to put it on your balance sheet so that investors and users of the financial statements can actually see it and then provide additional disclosures. And from what we're hearing from different industry discussions, what initially I think people thought was a very narrow scope, oh, it's only gonna be those, you know, those people who hold the, the private keys, the actual custodians, it's actually being interpreted much more broadly. So what we're seeing is there's many entities out there, um, whether they're financial service entities, fintech companies, broker dealers, who are all wondering like, man, I don't want to lose my customers because they're gonna all do crypto somewhere else and then potentially take their money away from my business, right? So let me find a way to keep them. And so what they do is, they don't want to touch crypto. The regulatory environment is still very uncertain. And so they say, you know what? If you're our customer. You're a partner, right? <laughs> if you're our customer, we'll introduce you to a digital asset entity and provide you the interface to say, now you can buy and sell your Bitcoin. Um, those entities are also now finding themselves to be in the scope of SAB 121 and having to gross up, which Bringing those assets on balance sheet is a huge regulatory um, impact, particularly for many of the banking entities. Yeah, I think building on that, Amy, so as we saw, the SAB has made it more challenging for banks to engage in the space. And the 
Um, you know, custody is nuanced, especially for regulated entities. So um, in 2021, the SEC released other <laughs> guidance um, to, to basically require the creation of this special purpose broker dealer. And what that guide, it set, the guidance set, you know, clear um, rules, I guess, about how custody should work for digital asset securities, which that's, you know, a certain bucket. Um, and it didn't allow for self-custody. So um, as of November, there were no special purpose broker dealers registered with the SEC or FINRA, which is the broker dealer self-regulator. And then to make things more complicated, FINRA has its own process for um, broker dealers that want to engage in digital assets either be by becoming newly registered or as existing entities. Um, and FINRA's model is a limited or non-custodial model. So um, it's not, you know, FINRA and the SEC are not entirely consistent in their approach, which I think is just an illustrative of like the complexity of multiple regulators. Um, and um, they, you know, their, their coordination is still being worked out, but um, the, the conse part, another consequence, I guess, is just that it's pushed unintentionally pushed activity out of the regulatory perimeter. Aaron, what about a tax angle? What, what do uh, custodians of digital assets need to be worried about? Yeah, so um, in late 2021, uh, I was actually passing a law in November of 2021, there was a law called the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, which, among other things, uh, placed a requirement on digital asset brokers to report gains and losses to their customers. And there was a lot of debate, if you guys remember, back to 2021, actually on the Senate floor, there was debate about how do you define a digital asset broker. What we have right now in the law is that anyone who facilitates the transfer of a digital asset for consideration, right? So that's really broad, right? Their theory, the discussion on the Senate floor was, well, does that bring in, you know, someone who's a minor or a validator, you know, in their dorm room or just doing it at home? You know, what does that scope look like? Um, important thing for custody is custodians seem to fall within that definition, right? They're generating consideration, facilitating transfer, safeguarding. Do they have that obligation to, to report? Um, something that's really important both for custodians to think about in that context, and I, I should say that the regulations on these rules are still forthcoming. The law was supposed to be effective January 1st of this year, 2023. There was a notice right before Christmas Eve, uh, actually the day before, um, that said that the rules would be delayed until further notice because, you know, the how to implement is a big question. Now, um, one of the important aspects that everyone should be thinking about, custodians as well as you know, miners, investors alike who, who have someone custodying their assets is how do you enable specific identification of the assets that are being transferred? It sounds simple, right? But it's really important from a tax, um, a tax gain loss calculation and a tax reporting standpoint. When you all trade or, or want to sell um, your digital assets, you want some certainty on what the gain or loss is. So these rules allow you to specifically say, I would like to trade this high basis asset or low basis asset. To do that, there needs to be specific technological specifications, um, enabling segregated wallets and cold storage. Um, and again, regulations will clarify, you know, the, the specific rules around this, but the important takeaway is it's a question to ask, something to be aware of, and when those regs come out, to uh, you know, pay attention. So Aaron, I think one of the things that you just talked about as you were, as you were speaking made me think of, it's really important for the custodian to have really good controls or internal controls. Um, and I think you know, if, if you are looking for somebody else to custody your digital assets, maybe because you don't want to be on the headlines for the next loss of how much Bitcoin because the private keys were lost. But, you know, one of the things that's really important is understanding, like, what are the controls at that organization? You know, if, if you are trusting them to safeguard your private keys, do you know that the, the controls are designed and operating effectively? And I say that a little bit, um, you know, 
it's pretty standard for whenever an entity would use a different service org or a different vendor to obtain what we call a SOC report. It's, it's um, independently verified or attested by a third party, which basically talks about the controls around the business as well as the controls over financial reporting and whether they're designed and operating effectively. And a lot of times the SOC reports are not all the same. And so it's really important to understand one, does the company or the entity actually have a SOC report? Two, what kind of report is it? Is it a SOC one, a SOC two, a type one, a type two? And three, what's most important I think is, what's the scope of that report? Does it actually include their crypto business? Um, that would be really important to know. And I think several years ago, SOC reports were completely foreign to this industry. Um, but we are seeing more and more entities, you know, coming up and, and issuing SOC reports or having um, third-party um, companies verify and issue those SOC reports, which provides more trust in the system, which in the end of the day, that's, that's overall net positive for the ecosystem. All right, let's keep going. Uh, we have another topic I want to bring you guys to here. Um, so this is about uh, tokenized assets and digital assets. Um, if we see the headlines, there's been a lot of news about uh, traditional financial institutions tokenizing traditional types of products, bonds, stocks, securities, debt instruments, uh, and launching those as tokens. Um, so uh, I guess, Megan, first question to you. you know, how does today's regulatory environment treat tokenized assets? Um, that's a great question, Joe. So, you know, in theory, the, uh, this should be the easy case of um, assets where there are already existing laws and rules on the books, and the regulatory treatment um, for tokenized assets should be the same. And I just want to quickly differentiate because we use tokenization to talk about the issuance, using blockchain to issue maybe a security, but then also using, um, you know, tokenization also under that bucket is um, just leveraging blockchain for clearance and settlement of securities or commodities, whatever, that have already been issued. And so the regulatory treatment um, for those two things actually is likely to be different. Um, there's a great deal of interest right now in the market in um, tokenizing assets, as you were saying, and um, there's also a little hesitation because of this 2021 SEC guidance that I talked about already. Um, which, you know, so there's, there's some confusion about do firms need to set up this special purpose broker dealer to tokenize assets. And I just add that, you know, I think from a regulatory perspective, like these things are still not really black and white. Uh, we're still sort of in this whole securities commodity debate, unfortunately, um, you know, still um, when it comes to other asset types. So um, a lot of these issues are still being worked out. Aaron, what happens when you tokenize a traditional asset and make it a digital asset? What, what, what's the tax impact of that? I'm, I'm going to pick up where, where Megan left off, right? Because I think we all have the same question from a regulatory, a tax, and an accounting standpoint. And depending on the asset, right, the underlying as well as the rights and obligations to a holder of a tokenized asset, you could get to a different answer on what type of property that is, security, commodity, right, something else, like I was saying before. So, so that's where we start from a tax standpoint. What's the thing? What's the thing? How does it relate to that underlying? What are the rights and obligations? Really going through and understanding what it means to hold that, as the, that token. What, what are the risks? So that's really where we start. And like I said earlier, I recommend starting early. You know, it's important to know or have a view on that treatment before you launch. What that will inform, it'll inform um, the method through which you launch the token, the structures that you employ, right? Do you use a foundation? You know, do you look to something like a DAO, right? Do you, you know, have it as uh, something that's centralized that you have control over? And there's different structures from a tax standpoint that you want to think about that will impact both the uh, issuer of the token as well as the holders of the token. So it's really important to start early, get that view, and then you know, as you know, guidance comes out from the IRS, from other regulators, continue to evolve. So it's not, crystal, it's not clear cut, right? There's a, there's a complicated set of questions here with a complicated set of answers, potentially. I, I, I wish it were. I what wish it were clear. What happens if you get it wrong? If you get it wrong, um, you know, it's important to at least have, you know, that explanation. 
um, you know, behind what you were what you were doing, right? And if you can demonstrate, you know, this is what we were doing, this is what we were thinking. Here's our documentation, and have it at the time you're going through it, right? It it at least provides that support. You know, there's other pathways, and we can go on sort of how you can get certainty before launching. I mean, there are procedures that you can go to, you know, the IRS and ask for a ruling and ask for cl clarity on it. Um, but generally, the documentation and developing that early is key. And Amy, any differences here on accounting? Same question for you. What happens? I have to say, usually, Aaron, your tax world and my accounting world with crypto doesn't always jive. But here, I have to say, I agree with you. Um, I, the thing when it comes with tokenization and accounting is, the first question you really have to start with is, do you actually have a new asset or a different asset? Or is it really just a representation or a digital representation of the underlying asset? Because accounting in its simplest form at the end of the day is understanding what the rights and obligations are and then how to account for them. So if the rights and obligations of the tokenized asset is identical to the underlying asset, Joe, the accounting is probably going to be very similar. But I say that it really depends because you have to go into each specific asset and really understand what the rights are. And sometimes, traditionally, maybe that's easy because you can just read a contract. Well, here in this world, we may have a smart contract that requires you to have some additional technical knowledge or skill set to actually really understand what are the rights. So that may be a little bit challenging, but at the end of the day, you really need to understand what the rights are to figure out the accounting. All right, great. So th that may have sounded complex. What if your answer in your head is, okay, well, I'll just move to the Bahamas and this will be a lot easier, right? Like, does that work, guys? I mean, is there a, a material difference between uh, global jurisdictions uh, or the U.S.? Are there, uh, uh, I think, Megan, we'll start with you. What do you think there? Sure. Um, thanks, Joe. So, uh, yes. I, in short, yes. Um, other jurisdictions, you know, the U.S. is a major marketplace, but there are other jurisdictions that are moving forward at a faster pace, I think, in terms of clarifying their policy expectations. Um, the EU comes to mind. Um, and I think in the U.S., the pace of change has been both intentional and unintentional. Um, so we, you know, I, I mean, I just would say that in the U.S., our, our policy is a little complicated for the moment. Um, but also, I think what the environment is today is not what it will be in five years. So, um, you know, there's, there's just still a lot more to come. And, and does being, you know, in a more friendly environment jurisdiction, uh, does that actually help you? I mean, I mean, doing business in the U.S., there's still going to be the tentacles of the regulation system here. That's right. I mean, I think it's for businesses, you know, to make their own decisions about where and how they want to operate. But, um, you know, certainly the United States, um, again, is a big market and businesses, you know, want to operate here and elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, I am very empathetic to the fact that the environment presently is a little confusing and <laughs> you need to pay, pay close attention. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> Other thoughts there? Uh, from a tax standpoint, domicile is choice to an extent. Um, you know, th there are different rules, you know, perhaps, you know, there's not really clarity globally, but if you do want to establish a business or launch a protocol, right, you know, often with decentralized protocols, we have this conversation because the question is, where does that protocol live? Who owns it? You know, it, it's, it, you don't really define borders around a protocol that's decentralized. So you look a lot to where are the people that are developing it, who has control, who has management. There's you know, general principles that, that we outline um, in thinking about that domicile choice. Um, the US is compa compared to the rest of the world. Um, you know, I've referenced earlier the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, um, you know, the, the um, cost basis reporting. Um, the OECD globally issued the Crypto Asset Reporting Framework, which, which is similar in some ways. Um, that's an extension of the common reporting standard globally that the OECD has implemented that is in place in a number of European, um, Asian, and Latin American countries. The important, the interesting thing I should say is that one of the countries that has not adopted the common reporting standard is the United States. One of the questions that comes out of you know this, and it's 
interesting and a little funny, it's coming out of the crypto space, is does the United States sign on to something like CARF? You know, that's a question that's out there. You know, does that bring them into CRS? There's some reciprocity and information reporting of, uh, of, of assets and transfers that happen. So a um, lot to, uh, you know, unpack there, but um, that's uh, a few on, on domicile choice. If I could just add, Joe, yep. you know, in an ideal world, the, there would be some sort of like global regulatory framework where standards were somewhat consistent across different jurisdictions, but the reality is that that is not likely to happen. It's not going to happen. So, um, you know, for businesses that want to operate in multiple jurisdictions, which, you know, many large businesses do, these regulatory issues will, will remain and will remain a little complicated. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Megan. Amy, thoughts, final thoughts on this one? So on the accounting side, I talked about the FASB before. They're the ones who create the accounting standards in the U.S. The IASB creates the accounting standards um, internationally under IFRS. Certain countries may follow in, like country-specific um, accounting rules too, but the accounting model under the FASB and the IASB are slightly different. And so I talked about the FASB that currently has a project on their technical agenda to address the accounting the IASB does not. Um, and so there are differences from the accounting perspective, which is really important to Megan's point, if you have a company that wants to work in multiple jurisdictions, their books and records are gonna likely look different. And so somebody who's looking at those financial statements and reading them should really understand that it could be actually the same business, but just being reported differently under different accounting rules. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so that is our time, guys. We appreciate uh, the panel. Guys, thank you so much for your expertise here. Thanks for everybody in the audience. Uh, and if you'd like to hear more, find us on Twitter.